Ladies and gentlemen, this session, The Future Is Now, Are You Ready?, is hosted by AARP. Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to get started out of respect for everyone's time. I'm sure people will be coming in now that the governor has finished. And if he's not finished, but please go and tell him that AARP told, told him to hurry up. <laughs> um, <laughs> but thank you so much for being here for this session. Uh, the, welcome to The Future Is Now. Are you ready? Um, if you really are ready, then let's begin. I, we all know that technology is shaping our present and our future. Uh, the number of people reaching age 100 and older is rapidly increasing. Many of you in this room will very easily reach the age of 100 and older. There have been dr dramatic advances in technology, both in transportation options, healthcare options, and also in transportation options. We've heard a lot about transportation since we've been here. So as people are aging and the technology is rapidly increasing, how does that impact the quality of life for not just older adults, but for communities and for young people, for everyone? We're gonna talk about that today. And to do that, that, we have three panelists and also two responders who are going to be sharing their expertise and their wisdom with you and what we hope will be a very engaging and interactive session. So let's first talk about three different areas that we're going to be addressing today. One, of course, is autonomous vehicles. They're here, um, they're being tested. The other, of course, is the telehealth. You've heard a lot about telehealth or telemedicine, and then broadband expansion. And we'll pull all that together for you very shortly. So allow me now to introduce our distinguished panelists. And let me start with the forever distinguished, John Dingo, who recently retired from uh, Congress after serving 59 years. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, I think he deserves a Purple Heart. Um, he was ranked one of the most powerful members of Congress during his tenure and one of the most eloquent speakers. And after having just chatted with him a little bit, I, I, I would vote for the eloquent speaker uh, issue as well. He has worked closely with the automobile industry during his years as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. So he has kept a very watchful eye on autonomous vehicles and all the issues surrounding them. He has also exhibited a very high degree of savvy in other technological areas. Uh, he is widely known as one of the most skilled and effective Twitter users in the universe, uh, with nearly 240,000 followers. And if you are not a follower, once you leave this session today, I bet you will be a follower. <laughs> so thank you for being here, Congressman Dingo. Also, we have Nancy McKeague, who's Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff for the Michigan Health and Hospital Association and also a former member of the legislative staff in both the Michigan House and the Michigan Senate. She has more than 30 years of experience. She started when she was 15 in government relations and nonprofit association <laughs> management. Nancy is active in legislative and regulatory issues impacting health care at both the state and the federal levels, and she frequently testifies as a subject matter specialist. So thank you for being here, Nancy. And then we have our own, of course, Melissa Seifert, who is Associate State Director of Governmental Affairs at AARP Michigan. She has worked with both uh, Republican and Democratic state legislators and for a multi-client lobbying firm in Lansing. As our chief lobbyist, Melissa has advocated for the organization on both tele on telehealth, broadband, caregiving, and many, many, many other issues as well. So thank you for joining us. And to respond, to keep these folks, and this is going to be a very informal session. You all, I've seen many of you have been sitting, you know, listening. We're going to be engaging and talking with each other. So to respond and keep these folks very honest and make certain that they aren't just talking up here about policy, but they're actually talking about real life, real world issues, we have with us Mayor Brian Barnett, who is the mayor of Rochester Hills. It is home of the Older Persons Commission, which actually serves 1,100 older adults a day per day in, in Rochester Hills. Uh, Mayor Barnett is also the, uh, the chairman elect for the United States Mayor's Conference. Um, so he'll be taking us from that role very soon. So he's gonna tell us what all of this means for his community. And then we have our own person, our own chairman of our board who needs absolutely no introduction. If you ever go anywhere with Chris Holman, everybody knows Chris Holman. But I want, just in case you've forgotten, I want to let you know that he is also uh, the CEO and founder of the Michigan Business Network. He was also the national chair of the Small Business Administration, and he has been a liaison from the MEDC, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, to small business. So we've got small business, we've got communities, and we have a panel of experts here who are going to share some information with us. So let's get started. Mr. Dingle, you're gonna be first. Tell us, before we actually start with the questions, just tell us a little bit about autonomous vehicles and what you consider to be the future 
of autonomous vehicles and the impact that they will have on communities. That's a frightening suggestion. A friendly <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> I am here by the grace and the kindness of AARP and also because I am a close follower of the lovely Deborah, <laughs> who is seated down there at the table. I'm very proud of what AARP did for us when we were fighting through the health bill. It was a great success, and it has withstood something like 190 negative votes. Mm -hmm. It is a success. We also are looking at the future of medicine mm -hmm. and what it means is going to happen and what it means we will be doing mm -hmm. in this country. A man ought not die, as Dr. Zavago said, like a dog in a ditch. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, that is something that should not be permitted in one of the richest and the strongest nations in the history of mankind. And I am very grateful that I had the opportunity to work on many things. One of the things which is, you are very much concerned about is, of course, automobiles and how they're going to drive as we find ourselves sitting not behind the steering wheel, but sitting there and hoping that the car gets us where we want to go. <laughs> and hoping that we will not do something foolish. Unhappily, it has been said that it is not the nut behind, rather on the car, but the nut behind the <laughs> steering wheel. And I'm not certain that we are ready for any of these things at this time. We don't have the readiness for taking care of what it is that we have to do and how we have to prepare ourselves for it. We have the laws that have to be adopted. We have organizational support like the AARP. Mm -hmm. We have all manner of actions that have to be taken by state government, local government, and by those of us who really care about continuing mobility, mm -hmm. which is going to be something of great concern to us all. Mm -hmm. And so those things were going to hurry. The industry is now preparing. You're seeing mergers of all kinds between the automobile companies and the technological mm -hmm. advances that are being made as a result of their mergers and alliances with other companies. And the end result is that we're finding that we're trying to be ready for this when it comes. Mm -hmm. We are a nation of people, supposedly, on wheels, and we are if we look. Mm -hmm. But we also are a nation which is totally unprepared for this huge change which is going to occur. My dad's first car, I remember, was a Cadillac that cost him $400. <laughs> and I, it, it seemed at that time to be a terrifying expense. <laughs> and I found that when I got out of the Army, my expense was below that. <laughs> but the end result is that we're going to push every which way and hope and pray mm -hmm. that it will happen. Mm -hmm. I was a shade tree mechanic, and I found that I was a disappointment to me and to everybody around me. <laughs> and I find that I need now four thumbs with an eye on the end of each, and of course with a light in the end of each <laughs> to guide me as to where I go. This is something which I think should terrify everyone, particularly the kids <laughs> who like to tinker with cars on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday. 
Having said this, I think I have gone beyond my time limit. <laughs> I thank you for the privilege of being here and for the, for the ability to associate with you and the other two very distinguished guests up here, as well as those who are out there in the audience. And I ask their kindness to me as I now shut up and <laughs> allow them to take over in a rather wiser form of behavior. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate you being here very much. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> got a lot to learn and you can help teach us. Nancy McKeague, uh, you have been involved with uh, medicine, health, hospitals for a very, very long time. What is it that everyone in this room should know about telehealth and how it can impact all of us in this room and our communities? Well, assuming that we uh, talk about telehealth and telemedicine as being the same thing, telehealth has the potential, it's a little bit further along than autonomous vehicles, but it has the opportunity to change our lives in just as dramatic a fashion uh, by allowing the provision of health and medical services by uh, transferring healthcare knowledge and information through technology uh, remotely, which will allow the provision of those services between physicians and advanced practice professionals uh, and patients and their family members from remote locations without requiring people in most circumstances to make a trip to their primary care physician or the specialist in the hospital. And especially in remote areas and underserved areas, that's gonna have a dramatic and positive impact on people's lives. And we're already beginning to see that happen and expect that to continue and for that pace to pick up especially as we see broadband technology improve across the state. Most of you, I'm sure if I had you raise your hand right now, we would see that you're wearing some form of digital technology right now, whether it's a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, and we can capture some of that technology right now. And you have the ability to share that with your physician or the emergency room has the ability to capture that information from you if we should have to take you over to Mackinac Straits this afternoon, which I hope we don't. <laughs> um, although they're a fine hospital, we're proud of them. Uh, but that sort of advance um, is a tremendous benefit to people, especially as families don't live as close to one another as they used to, and we have to patch together information from them and deliver it in a different capacity than we did before. So we're excited about those changes. But as Congressman Dingell points out, the uh, law and regulation lags behind the technology right now. And so we will see public policy continue to evolve. It's, a, it's an exciting time to be involved in it, but there are some perils attached to it as well. So I think you'll see it be part of an evolving debate and it will be an intensely interesting one, I think. Your little skepticism in both of your comments. So, Melissa, tell us, I mean, in terms of <laughs> whether or not we're ready. You know, AARP's here, we're talking about broadband, telehealth, we're talking about autonomous vehicles. Tie all those together for us. Yeah, absolutely, of. absolutely. I'll be more positive. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, you know, when we talk about these issues, I think a lot of people are like seniors, technology, you know, and yeah, they use it, you know, <laughs> the jig is up. So, um, why we're talking about this today is one of AARP's major initiatives is livable communities and making sure that people can age where they want to age and age in place. And by allowing individuals to maybe use autonomous vehicles and, and use telehealth, and, and it makes your community more appealing, so people are gonna wanna come to it. Um, and that's really our goal. I like to call it walker to, I mean, I'm sorry, stroller to walker kind of theory, where mobility issues are going to be the same with a mother with a stroller as they are with somebody with a walker. So you want livable streets, you wanna make sure there's access to grocery stores, access to healthcare, that might be through telehealth, access to transportation. Maybe the autonomous vehicles aren't going to be privately owned vehicles, but they'll be more of like a fleet bus type situation. So if those ever come around, that could be an opportunity as well. So making these communities as appealing as possible um, so people can age where they wanna age in the same place is really why we're talking about these three issues today. And one of the things that we know is that everyone wants to age in place. Correct. That's their, their preference. Mayor? 
<laughs> You've got 1,100 people a day going through uh, a, a center in Rochester Hills. You've heard about the technology, you heard a little bit about autonomous vehicles and broadband. What does that mean for your community? What does all of this mean for Rochester Hills? Well, t uh, to me it means as a, as a leader uh, and as other leaders in the room, we have to, we have to be ready for it. We, ha we can't uh, pretend that it doesn't exist and I like to think I wanna position my community as being on the front end of it. Mm -hmm. um, technology is changing so fast. Uh, you think about, it's, it's kind of funny to think, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we'd say don't get in strangers' cars and you know, don't meet people online. Mm -hmm. uh, now, literally, we summon strangers to come pick us up when we get in their cars. <laughs> right. um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, and, and ironically, as a public official, it should be noted that rideshare drivers have a higher favorability and trust uh, than, uh, than many public officials. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's certainly something that we have to embrace, and we see it happening several ways in, in a community like Rochester Hills. Number one, um, you know, you see it in the way people are choosing where to age in place. So in our community, as you mentioned, we have a very robust, vibrant, uh, the name is rough, it's the Older Persons Commission, but uh, they do a fantastic job of meeting senior services and needs. But uh, also, we, we, we have to do it in the way we design our community, uh, in the way we, uh, we look for walkable places to shop and to dine, and the way we design our roads, and the way we design parking and, and all the different things that we have to kind of look at differently uh, if we want to be one of the communities where people recognize that we're in front of the change as opposed to, to, uh, to behind it. And I think in, in, in local government, at least, uh, you know, there's always three options, right? You can raise taxes, you can cut services, or you can innovate. Mm -hmm. uh, and we choose to innovate, and that, in that, that involves embracing so many of the technologies that uh, you've mentioned so far today. So thank you for that. You know, I you know, was four swimming pools that are inside of that older person's center. There are four swimming pools, travel, uh, pickleball, all sorts of things that are going on inside of there. It's actually the envy of many communities throughout the country. So if you get an opportunity, you should visit and take a look at that and replicate it if at all possible. So thank you for that. And then Chris, I mean, you know, Chris is also um, very engaged in small business, and he's also the, the um, again, the chairman of our, our board. So I want full disclosure here. But what? <laughs> he never does anything, but he's still chairman of our board. <laughs> Not just easy. <laughs> he does a wonderful job for us. But Chris, you work with small businesses for most of your adult life. How does all this impact small business? What's the impact? For well, them? you know, it's interesting. First of all, thanks for having me here, and thanks for our, all of you being here because we're we're all a part of this uh, kind of acquiescence in to a, a different tomorrow. And, um, you know, with all, with, with all due respect, my views of regulation will be very different than yours, John, because though regulation in, in a way, I, and we realize we need it, um, is, is really important to help control what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, it has always been on in the top three of problems for business. Uh, since I think 1776, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. is regulation. So business always feels that's somewhat of a hamper uh, for mm -hmm. progress. But, but I will tell you from the standpoint of uh, an entrepreneur, small business person, I see opportunity and I see it in a lot of different ways. And one is certainly the cybersecurity that is posing such a threat to all of us at all the time. Uh, that we really have to uh, innovate there. Well, that what happens when we need innovation? We spawn new businesses, we bring out new sciences, we bring out new procedures, and we build, basically build new businesses. Now, the biggest challenge right now, as all of you know, is getting people to fill the jobs in those businesses, but they're gonna be very different jobs. So, uh, again, the, the, the most important thing I think that's coming out of this is, is opportunity, and you talk about driverless cars, even the uh, automotive industry is no longer the automotive industry. It's the mobility industry mm -hmm. because they realize it's going to change a great deal in texture and who owns it and who buys cars. And you may find that uh, rather than 50 people buying a car each, you're going to have a Lyft or a Uber buy 50 cars mm -hmm. to take care of that same need. Mm -hmm. A lot of things are going to change. Um, but I, I have to tell you that this brave new world, uh, this always excites small business people because there's a lot of opportunity out there for it. And we. We appreciate it. We appreciate the opportunity to be heard here today. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I know that uh, President Pappas is in the audience and at Davenport does a tremendous job of trying to make certain that they train their students for the jobs that exist, where the future is. So you, you, you've, got a, you've got a hefty task in front of you. <laughs> uh, let's take a look. Uh, you mentioned, Congressman, you mentioned that there was some skepticism about driverless cars and that they're, we're not quite ready yet? 
we did an Epic MRA, and I'll put this up on the screen for you to look at. Epic MRA a survey, did a survey question. They commissioned, uh, ARP commissioned them, and they looked at Michiganders, and they asked them about driverless cars and their enthusiasm level over them. And so let's take a look at the poll results on the screen here. Across all age groups, um, you can see that 40% are very open to or interested in the potential of autonomous vehicles. 58% are skeptical about their potential or vow never to set foot in one of them. And not surprisingly, the numbers are even less optimistic for older adults. 35% are open or interested, and 62% are skeptical or disapproving for older adults. How do we change that? How do we, what do we need to do to bridge that trust gap in terms of, because they're coming, whether we're ready or not. What do we need to do? I think the guy that answers that question should be president. <laughs> and well, that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> the, the curse of the fact is that in a democracy or a republic as we have, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And you have all kinds of things competing for the public attention, for the public money. You have jobs, you have technology that has to, has to grow, you have the new equipment that has to be bought out and safe, you have the laws that have to be made to work with all of the things that are associated with making it be something that people will get into and ride. They have to, in a society like ours, they have to invest the money, which is going to be huge. And it is not going to be any easy expenditure of time, money, effort, or training of the workforce. And I can only say that the companies, regardless of who they might be, are going to work their hearts out mm -hmm. to try to get the money and the workers mm -hmm. and the training that's needed. The city governments and the state governments are going to have to do something mm -hmm. to make their part of the responsibility work. And that is going to be murder because everybody's going to have a different idea. And all of these things are going to come together in, in, in a terrible series of fights, which we do not necessarily understand at this time. And so putting this whole thing together into a workable, understandable way in which the work can be done and can provide the service of which we have need is going to be an extraordinary adventure. And it is something that we should have started on a long time ago, but the trouble was there was no consensus. Mm -hmm. And there was no willingness for us to do the things that we have to do to make it all work. And that's gonna be something that's gonna to have to be done by your organization, it's going to have to be done by the government, it's going to have to be done by technology and technologists, it's going to have to be done by all of the folks who have responsibilities in these areas, and it's going to have to be done internationally because cars go across state, local lines, and the end result is going to be <coughs> people who are going to have to work like the devil to make this whole thing come together. And that's, that has to happen, correct? And it's a huge investment in time and money and effort. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Nancy, you talked about telehealth and um, how it could improve the quality of care for so many folks, but then you also mentioned or alluded to their rural areas. So in, in your experience, have you seen a lot of disparities in terms of the quality of care that is provided throughout the state of Michigan? And would telehealth help to bridge that gap a little bit, whether it's the rural areas or whether it's access or transportation to quality health care? Have you seen disparities? 
there are disparities in care um, b just because of the access issues. Uh, and telehealth can and will continue to be able to help people bridge that gap. As good as any of our hospitals may be, if you're in a rural area, it's unusual for a hospital there to see as many of a certain disease or a certain case as you'll see in an urban center where the population is higher. So where you have access to telehealth or telemedicine, a physician in a rural area that has what may be an unusual case there can, through telehealth, consult with a specialist at another location. Mm -hmm. They can dial up a, Cle a Cleveland Clinic or a Mayo or another center of excellence and send digital images or consult with a physician there and say, I have this case that I'm concerned about or I have a question about, can we consult on this? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they, the, there's an actual um, exchange with the, the patient themselves, but you know, usually it's digital image, in, imaging, which is again why broadband mm -hmm. is so important. Um, because those are complex images and you want them to be clear. Right. And it, that's a pretty heavy download. So that provides people in rural areas or in areas that are underserved with access to specialists that they might not otherwise have. And that helps level the playing field. And we're really encouraged by work that's being done in that area. It also helps in areas where there, aren't, there may not be ready access to a children's hospital, for instance. Mm -hmm. So you get access to experts in that field of medicine. There is so much groundbreaking work going on right now in all of those areas that being able to have the ready exchange of that information is um, it, it's amazing to me and it seems to change on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, almost all of you see it, I'm sure, already in your electronic health records and your patient portals where you have the ability to go online and look up you know, what was my last prescription? What did that last test show? You can track your test over time. And with permission of another family member, you have the ability to do that for your, pa your parent or somebody else that you may be engaged in caregiving for as well. And so all those things go back to how do you help people age in place mm -hmm. and live their life the way you want to. And I'm sure all of you have had the conversation I know we have in our family. None of us feel like we are aging at the same pace our parents age. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I, I think that's wonderful. So if we all get to live longer and we can live healthier mm -hmm. and more independently, mm -hmm. and this is a way for us to help each other do that, mm -hmm. which I believe it is, mm -hmm. and we can spread that around the state and provide other people with access to that technology and that way to help them and which I believe it can, the hospital association is really proud to be involved in that effort. Absolutely, let's take a look, um, all of us, let's take a look at um, exactly where there are um, issues, unserved populations as it relates to broadband in the state of Michigan. I hope you can see the, uh, see the screen there. Mel, you wanna talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So the FCC defines broadband at 25 megabytes per second uploadability. So any place that's white on this map, they're good. Any place that's yellow, red, orange, bad, do not have adequate access to um, any type of that 25 megabyte per second upload. Um, so what that means is when, when Nancy's talking about telehealth and utilizing that technology, you need to have a higher bandwidth. And these places in um, that are colored, really, um, are the ones that do not have access. So look at the UP, for example. You know, they're already living really far away from many healthcare facilities, and now they don't even have access to adequate broadband. So what does that do for somebody's preventative care or care in general? So the governor in his State of the State speech did call for an expansion of broadband, but because it's not overly regulated, we can't force these utility companies to go in and build the infrastructure, right? So it's kind of a, a chicken or the egg situation where we're really pushing for this, but it's not lucrative for them to build up in the UP because there's not as many households on that infrastructure line. So what does this look like? What are the solutions going to be? And that's why we're very active in the legislature, not to talk too much about policy, but that's my jam, so we're gonna do a little <laughs> bit. Um, 
But um, Mel's under 50, <laughs> by the way. You can tell from her language. <laughs> but um, so that's one of the issues too. Is just that we're really focusing a lot on all of these innovative ideas to expand broadband. Um, one of them, there's a bill to allow uh, communities to um, almost use like a millage type format to, to have the community buy in to building out that infrastructure. So right now, we are not opposing any, any innovative ideas uh, for expansion of, expansion of broadband. We're just trying to get that digital divide a little bit more uh, equal across the state of Michigan and make those yellow spots and red spots a little more white. <laughs> so that's, that's the goal right now. Thank you. Chris? Who's going to pay for this? I mean, small business will benefit to some degree by the talent in terms of broadband uh, that they can access, but who's going to pay for all this? Can well, we uh, A, who always pays for it? The customer, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what will happen. And, and those colored sections will go away as soon as it's cost effective to have it happen. Yep. So the reason they're not done is the big companies don't find a big enough profit center in those areas. But again, I look at this and say opportunity. This yeah. is a good mm -hmm. section for small businesses mm -hmm. to jump into and say, hey, we can live on a lesser margin, et cetera. There's going to be a position or a point here where the government is going to have to enter and say, we will subsidize this for the sake of public safety mm -hmm. to an extent, and then that will make it cost effective as well. But mm -hmm. a at the end of the day, pretty much everything on this planet is user based. Mm -hmm. And, and that's who reaps the, uh, the benefits of what it is. And, and that's who honestly should, should pay for it. But uh, it, again, it's a matter of opportunity being there. And, and uh, uh, it can be funded. It will be funded. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out as we were talking earlier is uh, one, of the, one of the major things that will come into play here is simplifying the system and the usability. Mm -hmm. uh, because we've got everything pretty much at our fingertips right now. We need to do what we need. Mm -hmm. It's just very difficult for a certain percentage of our population to handle. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the gentleman from Ford Motor Company the other day when he was presenting was talking about simplification, voice activation, those types of things. That, that's what's necessary. That'll say to the customer, this really is worth paying because this is not something you're going to be intimidated by. You're not going to forget how it works at that moment of trauma when you need it. But saying this thing will be infallible and you will know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So I think simplicity is another big piece of this. Cost versus value, right? Yeah, very much. Exactly. Mayor, how technologically astute is your community? Are they ready for this? Well, I think uh, that's a great question. You know, you, you put the numbers up there a little bit ago about uh, the number of folks that maybe were skeptical, skeptical about getting an autonomous vehicle. And I got, out of curiosity, how many of you in this room have ridden in an autonomous vehicle? It's a Three, three to five percent. So, I mean, before we we, we quickly criticize, uh, you know, the, these folks, I mean, it, this is something that most most of the population hasn't had an opportunity to. I had had an opportunity to do it with a company that's doing these in our city. And and you think about one of the things that you you need to do. Um, and as the congressman mentioned, uh, there's a lot of cost out there, and there's a lot of time investment. But what I look at, what I can do as mayor of my community is have the discussion. Right? A lot of people are intimidated by autonomous vehicles. And when you say, you know, in Columbus, Ohio, um, there's a 50% chance that if you order a pizza from Domino's, it's coming in an autonomous vehicle. Mm -hmm. And people understand pizza delivery, and they go, mm -hmm. oh, and they start to ask questions about it, and they go, okay, I get that. And if you're in Pittsburgh and you're between the rivers, you have about a 50% chance of hailing an Uber or a Lyft, I think it's a Lyft there, um, that is an autonomous vehicle. And okay, well, you know, you so you start to think about these things. I think if you'd asked that question mm -hmm. maybe 10 years ago and said, how many of you think Facebook will be a way that you'll communicate with your kids and grandkids in the future regularly? People would say, oh, the computers, I'm not, a, you know, that. you probably would have, again, a very high level of skepticism about using Facebook to communicate. And I think if you look at now, the average Facebook user, at least in our community, that's the number one way I reach my senior population generally on social media is through Facebook. That's how our OPC uh, 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 in basically uh, disseminates information more effectively than anything else. Mm -hmm. The thing we can do as leaders, and you know, sort of the movers and shakers of the state at this conference and in this room, is begin to have those discussions to break down those barriers. This is coming. If we all agree that technology is coming, then what we're, uh, I think, what's incumbent upon us to do is to have those conversations with our senior populations. Every Monday, I'm at the OPC, Number one, because I love our seniors. Number two, because I'm a smart politician. <laughs> uh, and we're talking about this. You know, we're talking about that. We still show videos. When I did my autonomous vehicle ride, we show videos of it. And people ask questions. They're really silly questions. I think they're really silly questions. But then they start to understand. And then they, they understand that, okay, you know, have you ever 
been in a lift? Have you ever had an emotion? Sure how easy it get, is to get the app? It's just like Facebook. And, you, and so you start to break down these barriers where people understand they become more uh, technologically savvy because, you know, my community is relatively highly educated, but most of them haven't been in an AV. Mm -hmm. But you start to have these conversations and you break it down and they understand pizza delivery, they understand taxis, they understand how those things work. And you know what they really love is the fact that they probably had some level of conversation uh, where their kids have said, you know, in a few years, um, you know, when your car dies, we might not get you another car. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in my community, we don't have public transportation. Sorry to bring that up. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but when you talk about the opportunity for this to extend mobility for the senior population <laughs> in my, my city, every mouth shuts and every eye opens and they listen mm -hmm. because that's what it means to them. Like, wow, so I could still get to here and there. I wouldn't have to own a vehicle and, and maybe this, this technology could extend my mobility into my 80s and 90s and beyond. And then they start to understand it. So I think there's a couple things. Number one, we have to have the conversations. Mayors are supposed to be the communicators in their community between the, the, the folks, the, the, the information, and the folks who need to get the information. And, and two, we just need to, we need to understand that this, uh, this is coming. It's incumbent upon us to leaders to have the conversations in our community. Absolutely, thank you. And we want to em emphasize, this is not just really for the older community either. And I know, Mel, you want to expound on that a little bit. But when you talk about age-friendly communities, we want communities where people want to stay. They don't want to go to Florida, I love Florida. They don't want to go to Florida or to Arizona or somewhere else, but they want to stay in their own community. And the same thing for you as a mother of two children. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, exactly what Paul is saying. And, and, you know, I think for so long, people view this aging populations as takers of resources when that actually is not the case. They actually are a huge economic driver. They're spending money locally. They're funding hospitals. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> it's really important to start thinking about um, – you know, your community as really a spectrum. You need all of it. You need me, a mother, two kids, going to school, paying taxes. You need the middle age group to, to be there and still be working and part of the workforce. And you need that older population too. And to be able to have a community that's going to provide all of the things that all of us need throughout the spectrum of our life is really the key. So if we can just make all of our communities age friendly, that we all can age in place, I mean, that would just be the dream. And having all of these technologies um, readily available is really going to be, um, I think, the key component to making people um, want to stay where we're at. There's a lot of, and we, I want to open this up to some questions from you now, but there's a lot of insecurity too around, um, for some folks, young or old, around accessing technology, putting so much out there online, you know, mm -hmm. who's stealing what from whom and the black web and all that. I know that there are fewer and fewer people getting engaged or involved with uh, information security. I know you guys at Davenport are doing some work in information security, but how do you, how do you assure someone that their information is safe when they go out and they put everything out there on the, the web? What do you do to help? What can we do to help make certain that, that they're, they're going to be protected? I mean, knowledge is key, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that really is. It's the educational component. Um, back to what the mayor said, you just need to constantly educate. Mm -hmm. Did you want? No, that's, that's exactly right. It's kind of interesting because it, it, a good instance of this, and, and we do not do a good job of this in, in the media, by the way, but a good instance of this is it was a couple, maybe three, four weeks ago, uh, all four of your newscasts through the day, and, and this is the Internet and everything else, uh, were, was about the autonomous vehicle accident, right? How many have seen a story about the incident of accidents in autonomous vehicles versus the incidence of accidents in normally operated vehicles, mm -hmm. which is much less, mm -hmm. much less. So our education process in many cases is backwards because we show them the things that people are interested in as opposed to the realistic picture. And that's, I think, our biggest challenge mm -hmm. is the education of the mm -hmm. public so that a lot of those anxieties go away. It's much safer to get in an autonomous vehicle than in a regular vehicle. There's a 700 um, fatalities last year on Michigan roads from driver error. Um, so, yeah, when you look at the comparison, there will be fatalities. No matter what you're doing, there's going to be fatalities. But when you look at the security and the safety, comparatively speaking, to someone being behind the wheel, um, it, it's, it's a no-brainer, quite frankly. It's a lot, lot, lot safer. Questions from all of you here in the room. I know, uh, Congresswoman Dingle, you've done a lot with autonomous vehicles. Um, and, and Judge McKeague, you've probably sent people to jail that were driving <laughs> they shouldn't have been. So, <laughs> so anyone else, any questions or comments from anyone? Yes, sir. 
Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a comment. My name is Roger Myers. I'm with Presbyterian Villages of Michigan. Oh, I'd yeah. like to congratulate AARP for having this session. Um, some of us have been talking with the chamber for years about the importance of this topic, and it's great that you've got this session. Um, one program that I'd like to, to um, share with you that I think is part of the future for the state, in fact, I know it's part of the future for the state, is called PACE, mm -hmm. Program for the All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly. Mm -hmm. PVM is very pleased to be part of two of those programs. Uh, one partnership with Henry Ford Health System that covers Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County, and a new program that's gonna cover parts of 14 counties in central Michigan in a partnership with the Michigan Masonic Home in Alma, and the PACE Center is gonna be in Mount Pleasant. Also, the Central Michigan University Medical School is <laughs> gonna become part of that. So that program allows seniors to stay in their own homes or their own apartments or their own condos where they want to stay mm -hmm. and be served with a comprehensive array of health care, social services, and we're excited about it. There's about 12 of these programs around the state, and we really appreciate that Michigan has been really one of the most progressive states in the country supporting PACE. So, you know, that's something that I think, uh, if you don't know much about PACE, and Congressman, uh, Woman Dingle, actually visited two of the PACE programs just recently. She was at a groundbreaking one day, and the next day she was at a grand opening, <laughs> so in Ypsilanti, in Dearborn, and we appreciate the Congresswoman's uh, support and interest in that. Um, okay, may I? Yes. <laughs> just so you are aware, we are fully supportive of that. We put it in our appropriations um, request every year to add more funding to those programs, yeah. respite care included, as well as adult daycare facilities and the PACE program. So completely agree with you, totally on board. So. Yes. Other questions, comments? Yes. You know, while she's taking the microphone to her, ARP did, or someone did a study and found out that the person that's going to live to be 150 years old exists today, is alive today. A hundred, is that you? You're saying, <laughs> there you are, right there. <laughs> but can you imagine what the, you want to make sure the quality of life of that individual is there as well and their ability to live the best life possible. So someone in this room might live to be 150. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for talking about this issue. My name is Kathleen Kovach and I'm the COO at Oakland County Community Health Network, which is the public mental health agency in Oakland County and I represent 26,000 people who come to us for services every year. And certainly we're having a hard and long conversation about transportation, how to have more real-time transportation for people, getting them to their uh, treatment appointments, to hospitals, really getting people integrated in the community. So I will say to you, you have a partner here uh, with a lot of people who have transportation needs. We want to make sure people are participating in their communities. I'd like to talk to you, Mayor, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, how to make communities much more accessible for people who have mental illness, developmental disabilities, and substance use issues, and they certainly want to participate in their communities, remain in their communities, and be active members, workers, taxpayers, and believe me, in the public mental health system, we do have a fair amount of money mm -hmm. that goes into transportation. So how do we partner with our resources, with our finances that we're receiving through Medicaid dollars and some general fund dollars to work with you to really create a momentum for the need mm -hmm. and this whole how do you bring biz business and government together to have healthier communities and better outcomes for people. So I'd like to talk to you, or if you'd like to talk to me, please let's connect after this meeting. That's what you thank were saying. You. Thank you for that. That's what you were saying about collaboration and working together in order to be, be ready for the future in terms of technology and autonomous cars, that we can't be competing. Well, the past is the guide to the future. Yes. You can take any of the things that we have sought to try to move fast, and we found that they took a hell of a sight longer than we had <laughs> intended. If you take a look at telecommunications, you'll find that we are working like the very devil to make it move forward, mm -hmm. but it ain't moving forward fast. Mm -hmm. And we have huge numbers of people who are unserved mm -hmm. in this country, and we're finding that companies are buying other companies just to have the equipment that is there 
or the intellectual learning that is there. And whether you're talking about this being in foods, in food supply or drugs, pharmaceuticals, or whether you're talking about what we are talking about today, transportation and, and the concerns of our senior citizens and stuff, all of these things confront the same difficulty. The human inability to, to come to an understanding of what it is should be done, and, and we don't have enough money to not make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So all of these things have to be dealt with in, 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 in the concerns that we confront. And your comments were very good, ma'am. And the end result is that if we don't do these things and do them right the first time, we're gonna find we have trouble. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Detroit, we have the telecommunications that has to be arranged mm -hmm. so that we can work with Canada. Mm -hmm. We've got huge difficulties with the stations mm -hmm. in Detroit and in, 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 in Michigan and in, in Ontario, and it makes an unholy damned mess. Mm -hmm. And our regulatory bodies, the FCC and the Canadian body, have to, have to do something to make this work. Mm -hmm. We have transportation, and we're finding that all of these things have to come together. together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there has to be some intelligent management of these things. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have desperate need of transportation, and I note that there, that there are people in the telecommunications, not in the telecommunications, but in the transportation business or in the government business that say, hell no, we're not gonna have that here. Mm -hmm. uh, we, this is wrong. Well, that's one of the weaknesses of a democratic or a republican form of government. Uh, it, 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 it is hell's own job to make the bloody thing work and to get people to work together to see to it that it does happen Absolutely. and within a reasonable span of time. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, everybody's sitting around sucking their teeth or grinding their teeth, trying to hope that maybe something is going to, is going to come together. Uh, we started out on trying to deal with passenger systems on rail, and it was an unholy mess. We're finally now just getting it to the point where there is some rail system moving us between Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, down into Missouri and St. Louis, and on up into uh, the headwaters of Mississippi. And California's got the same bloody problem, but they think that they are in fact a nation all on their own. They have an economy <laughs> that's about equal to the, to, the, to the fifth largest or the fourth largest country in, in, in the world. And you can't pound their head hard enough to have them understand that they're still a part of the United States. And <laughs> So when you're, when you're dealing with health care, uh, you, you take a look up in, in the biggest employer in Macomb County. You know who it is? The hospital. Oh, of course, yeah. yes. They, of course. And, 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 and we think, boy, tanks or automobiles or, or, or other things that they make up there, that's what's going on, but it ain't. Yeah. It's, it's health care. And, and, and we're trying to take care of those people. And if you look, you'll find that the problems are virtually the same every damn where we have to confront them. Mm -hmm. And you folks and your folks and your folks and mine and, and the people who are represented here in the audience, they've all got the same bloody problem mm -hmm. of trying to make this whole silly mess come together and provide services. And the interesting thing is that where we used to have a, a, a biologist, he was a biologist. Now he's a microbiologist, or maybe he's a, he's a uh, phonetic biologist, <laughs> or maybe he's a, some kind of an expert on something that does about the same work <laughs> that all of the other folks in the business do. We had, we had in, in, in the committee, 
we had we had lawyers. They were great, mm -hmm. but they weren't doing lawyer work. They were doing biologist work. <laughs> I, I I hired a guy to get in peace with the environmentalists, and I'm a bald-headed liar if he didn't wind up uh, working on all kinds of, of things. And he wound up not being what he was, a plant biologist and an environmentalist, but he wound up being, a, being a, a guy who did all kinds of things, some good, some bad, some just plain nutty, and, and almost all of them desperately necessary. Mm -hmm. And this is, this, is, this is a situation that curses this whole society. And we're trying to make it work. And we're finding that 330 million people mm -hmm. are a hell of a sight more difficult <laughs> to govern for than were the 130 million who were the citizens of the United States when I was elected to Congress. Absolutely. And it's an, it is an unholy, bloody mess <laughs> to try and make this situation work for the benefit of all the folks out here and all the folks around in Michigan and then the folks who are all in the United States. And it's, 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 we're, we're doing our level best and there, there are a lot of wonderful, honest, smart people and they're trying to make this thing come together and, and work. And then we've got a few rascals that are trying to... <laughs> and with that, we probably should transition. Kind of, <laughs> gather some kind of a game. So uh, <laughs> the best thing we can do is, is to get together, work together, and understand that we simply cannot make this nation function as we would like to have it function unless we get ourselves together and push. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some, someone once said that if you want to travel fast, you travel alone. If you want to travel far, you travel with others. So uh, we've got a long way to go, so we need each other. In the uh, three minutes that we have left, I'd like for each of you to just share one thing with this uh, audience that you'd like them to take away. What's the takeaway for anyone here today? Nancy, do you want to give them a takeaway? Oh, I think the takeaway on telehealth and telemedicine is that you're at the point where you have the opportunity to design how you're going to control your own healthcare future um, and it, it, take charge. You get, you, you're at the point where you get to design it. And, and, we've, got to, and we've got to do this too mm -hmm. because if we don't, our medicine is going to smack of the 19th or the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. You heard right. it right here. <laughs> That's your takeaway. Thank my you. takeaway is that the congressman is my favorite person in the whole world right now. <laughs> but also, I just want you all to know that seniors are savvy. They do want technology. They do want to be able to age in place. And they are not just takers of resources. I think that is the biggest thing that I would like you all to know, is that they want to contribute. They want to be here. They want to live here. But they want to do it with dignity and with purpose. And by having these um, technologies available, they can do that. Thank you. Two minutes left. Mayor? I, I would agree. I think uh, um, the takeaway I hope is that the innovation is here. It's coming, and it's uh, it's in communities, and it's coming in tech and crisis. Uh, I think the best set up in the future, and I would agree, um, that uh, the senior population are great, great allies. My community has been engineered to grow very quickly, and they are especially desperate to help us uh, lead innovation in the future. And also, uh, California is a great place. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Chris. <laughs> well, I'd like to uh, jump on uh, Congressman, uh, uh, the Congressman's uh, thought of working together because I think that's, that's what's going to save us all. But I, I think the, the thought to leave we here is, is not to be afraid of the unknown, but to regale in the opportunities it's going to afford us. And I think we're going to take advantage of those opportunities and we're going to have a better world every day because that's what we've done so far. Thank you, and I'm going to defer my last uh, comments to you, actually, in, in deference to you. What do you want people to leave here today thinking about or taking away? It, you can be about anything you want. It doesn't even have to be about what we talked about today. Let's make it a little interesting. Right? <laughs> what would you like people to take away today? One thought, one idea that you want them to take with them, work together or something else? Well, we've got to start, and I think, I think things are going on in Washington in a way that are going to tell us that we've got to get together, and if we don't, we're liable to find ourselves a third-rate nation. And with that, <laughs> very optimistic <laughs> closing. 
I wanted to thank all of you for being here today. Thank you for giving us the gift of your time. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you.